gone missing under somewhat mysterious circumstances, and they're actually very, very similar to a case that I have covered in the past, and that was Jason Landry, if you remember that case. I'll try to put that link in the description, but they are all, like, very eerily similar, and they're all young men around 19 to 21, so if you want to watch that one first and then come back to this one or watch this and then go to that one just so you can see how odd that these are so similar but anyway jumping into the first one that i want to talk about is actually a requested case somebody requested this and it made me think of the second one that i will be talking about this is like the longest intro i've ever done but so the first one is 19 year old Brandon Swanson and he was wrapping up his first year of college in Minnesota and it was at Minnesota West Community College and this was in 2008. So I have a picture of Brandon up on the screen now and because Brandon and his friends had just kind of wrapped up this year, they kind of wanted to celebrate and just like have a nice send off for the year. I think they had a couple of friends that were leaving. It was like a goodbye party as well. So they were just celebrating and they were celebrating with drinks and potentially drugs. That's, we're going to get into that later, but it's very wishy-washy on that. So certain witnesses came forward to say that Brandon most definitely had at least one shot of alcohol and they weren't like no one was intentionally keeping track of how much anyone was drinking other than they they it, it might have been like a cheers thing they did know that he took at least one shot he could have had much more he could have had slightly more or he could have have had no more than that one shot and so Brandon eventually leaves this party and they say that the fashion that he left in was not looking very intoxicated. So that was said by, I think, multiple witnesses. There was another witness that said that maybe he was more intoxicated than those other people were willing to admit. So that's kind of on the fence. It was around midnight on May 13th, 2008, that Brandon Swanson left this party in Canby, Minnesota to drive to his parents in Marshall, Minnesota. And the drive is only like 40 minutes, so it's really, I looked at the Google Maps and I will have some pictures on the screen, but it's a pretty direct shot from Canby to Marshall. So actually on the screen now is an image of the most likely route that GPS would have taken Brandon if he used GPS or just the most likely route he would take, period. And after having left at midnight, Brandon would have been expected home right around 1, eight, one in the morning or just a little after. And at 1.15 in the morning, Brandon got his car stuck in a ditch. And unknown if this accident was a result from being under the influence, maybe, maybe not, I don't know, but Brandon did try to initially call his friends to have them come help, I don't know why they weren't able to come help, maybe they were under the influence and could not drive, or they were asleep or not picking up, but regardless, 45 minutes passes after him getting into the ditch that he ultimately calls his parents and they end up like coming to get him like getting in the car and coming to get him right away and he called his parents closer to two in the morning it was like 1 54 that he initially called them he was not able to tell his parents where he was located and i do not know how this I don't know what kind of phone Brandon had. I feel like that's a very important piece of information because one, it's 2008. A lot of people have smartphones and the, the fact that he wasn't able to just like look at his GPS, look at his maps is very odd to me. So I'm kind of wondering if he did not have a 
a smartphone and was not able to do that because he couldn't tell them where he was and in fact he wasn't where he thought he was or said he was. Brandon tries to explain to his parents where they are and they pull up to that location where he mentioned and he was not there. His car was not there but they're on the phone with him still so they say that they're gonna start flashing their headlights and Brandon actually like sees it off in the distance and he says okay I think you guys are like towards the town of Lind, L-Y-N-D and I'm gonna put a picture of this on the screen now just so you know the area and Lind is actually very close to Marshall so he made it pretty far like he's pretty close to Marshall at this point and Brandon felt like the, the distant lights flashing wasn't too incredibly far and he knows Lind at least decently well so he says okay meet me in the Lind Tavern parking lot and like we'll deal with the car in the ditch tomorrow I will walk there it's not far we'll get it sorted and so Brandon got out of his car still on the phone with his parents which this is a super smart move Think like thankfully he was on the phone with his parents but obviously something went awry because he's missing and um, at, at least we have a bit of information from this phone call so the call was 47 minutes in length with his parents when Brandon abruptly shouted oh shit and that was the last that they heard of Brandon literally ever and I I don't know there's um, a little bit of discrepancy whether the call was dropped or the like his parents just didn't hear anything and they like called out for him and then they like redialed I there's some discrepancy there I do want to mention that before this happened he was Brandon was on the phone saying that he was cutting through some grassy areas he had to climb over a fence he passed by some gravel roads and he also mentioned that he could hear flowing water and there's actually a river right in that area which is likely what he heard and that river is called Redwood River and it runs like very nearby to Lind so Brandon's parents called and called and called and never got Brandon back on the phone. The phone was ringing and that's kind of an important piece of information. The, the That the phone wasn't turned off, it wasn't smashed, it wasn't, you know, drowned in water. It was at least getting to his phone and ringing. By the time morning, like either late, late night or early, early morning rolls around, it's going to Brandon's voicemail. I think it's assumed that his phone died at that point and Brandon's parents are, you know, this whole time they're calling, they're driving, they're searching. They have some information but not a ton and eventually they're like, okay, this is going nowhere. We need to call for help. So at 6.30 in the morning, that's what they do and they call police and say that they're missing their son and according to police, Brandon's car was found in a ditch on the borders of Lincoln and Yellow Medicine. So I was confused what this meant, but those are counties in Minnesota. And they do account for quite a bit of a stretch. Um, since if, if you think of it, like this county up is Yellow Medicine. This county down is Lincoln. So it's like this border it was the road that his car was found in the ditch on. So the absolute minimum, the wherever his car was, the shortest walking distance on that border, those county borders, from that border to Lind, to Lind, Lind Tower, six minute drive, but an hour plus walk, like right around an hour, but a little over an hour walk. So I'm not sure that Brandon knew that when he said meet me at Lind. I think he thought that his parents were a lot closer because an hour walk in the middle of the night is very I think that's long especially when you're not sure where you are so I actually am putting a picture on the screen now it doesn't show like the county borders but it you know shows the area and the common route that I guess if you're taking roads you would take so many 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 
searches followed Brandon's disappearance, and I'm talking all-terrain vehicles, foot searches, horse searches, dogs, nothing led to anything. Nothing at all. So there's obviously theories about what happened to Brandon, and I, again, want to call attention back to the discrepancy about um, whether the call was dropped, whether... The, he, was, he remained on the line, but he dropped his phone and they were calling and calling his name. According to Brandon's mother, she said that they didn't hang up and they did feel like the call was still active and eventually hung up and redialed. Again, it's a discrepancy. I feel like we can lean towards that being correct because they were there. Brandon didn't hang up, possibly dropped his phone or, you know, something happened. If we are assuming that Brandon's parents never hung up, I feel like we could potential could potentially rule out foul play or a wild animal because wouldn't you have heard they would have heard that at least most likely nine nine and a half out of ten scenarios you would hear a wild animal or foul play come upon Brandon if they were still on the phone. I think the only scenario that makes sense if the call was not dropped is if Brandon literally saw someone that he knew was planning to hurt him and he literally, oh shit, dropped the phone and dead sprinted away from it and then if anything happened, he was far long gone. And so for that to be true, there would have to be, you know, somebody that wanted to hurt him that he would recognize. And I think maybe the same goes for if it was a wild animal, like, I don't know, I guess what's in that area, like mountain lions, is that in the area? If he saw, you know, but what I don't understand is if, even if you're sprinting away, why is the last thing you, you hear is just, oh shit, drop the phone, nothing else. You feel like he would think and know that his parents were on the phone and would scream for help and they, you know, didn't hear any of that. So that brings you to the theory of no person, no animal, but literally an accident falling into a river, getting hypothermia, drowning and dying, not being able to get out and getting hypothermia in the water. It was, it was a cold, like 40 degrees or less. Um, so you can definitely get hypothermic if you're wet in those conditions. I feel like you would also be able to hear the, you know, him falling and potentially still yelling for help. That is what is so mysterious to me. And I do think it makes the most sense that, you know, maybe they thought they were still on the phone with Brandon, but the call was dropped or the call did get hung up. And because of the discrepancies, I mean, I feel like that is a possibility. And if you are, you know, operating under the assumption that they were, his parents were no longer on the phone right after he said, oh shit, I think so many more things are possible. I think he could have been met with foul play because they wouldn't have heard it, could have been met with a wild animal, could have fallen and would have heard a splash if they were still on the phone, any of those things. And it really is just a mystery still today about what the heck with the phone and, you know, what could have happened. They, there is, um, back to the theory about foul play, there something about him owing drug debt, and this is a very loose theory. There is really not a ton to substantiate this. There was a pipe in Brandon's car, so at least points to... Brandon, you know, potentially using drugs, but that's a leap from using drugs to owing drug money. But sometimes those things that you hear people talking, they are true. They are not just made up. A lot of the times they can be, but I think it's worth talking about. Another odd thing was that Brandon's car doors were all like opened upon the discovery of his vehicle, which I think is so weird. Just imagine, like, you in his shoes. You're not leaving your car doors wide open. Can you think of any circumstance you'd, you'd ditch your car, and then you're going to, like, walk an hour, but he may have thought it was less, but leaving your car doors open is so odd. So now reasons you'd leave your car door open, I'm thinking you're under the influence. Or it was somebody else, it, like a complete stranger happened upon his car and went through it. Or someone was following him again, maybe that owed, or that he owed money to, and they tried to get the money from the car, or tried to get whatever they wanted or needed from the car, didn't find it, followed him, did something to him. I think all of these things are just so 
makes sense. Nothing makes sense. Um, I think the theory that is the most stood behind is that he did just have an accident and fall into the river and, you know, I guess the river, I don't know how long it is or how, where it opens up, but it is, it would be hard to find a body or anything if it's, they're searching this area, but he was in the river and now he's miles and miles and miles away. I, I think that's probably the theory that I probably get behind the most. I, I don't know why his doors were open then, unless, again, you know, a random stranger happened to come by, but I'm just, like, talking in circles now, so really, um, neither Brandon or his phone was found. I would imagine a very extensive search for his phone happened because, you know, Brandon could have fallen into a river and had been miles away, but his phone should have been in the area, maybe. It could have, if there was foul play, that could have been taken out of the area as well. So, there is nothing. And they, this family is still searching for answers. And the next disappearance is um, 19-year-old Bryce Laspisa. La Laspisa, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. But this is one of those cases that me in particular, like, I can never forget because it just makes me think and think and think, like, what the heck happened to Bryce? So, I'm going to put a picture on the screen of Bryce, and he was, again, also 19 years old in his first year of college in Sacramento, California. So, Bryce did actually very well in his first year of college. He had really good grades. He was close very, very close to his roommate, Sean, and he loved his girlfriend, Kim, and Bryce's second year of college was about to start when his demeanor about life kind of started to shift. Witnesses say that Bryce was happy and eager to return to college, but things quickly changed. His roommate, Sean, and girlfriend, Kim, recount that Bryce started to become more withdrawn and sad. Kim caught him using Vyvanse, which is a drug used to treat ADHD, and he did not have ADHD, but he was taking it so he could stay up and play video games. And some of the side effects for taking this drug when you are not prescribed it include psychosis, depression, and mania. I think even if you are prescribed it, you can potentially have those side effects, but um, definitely if you do not need it, those things can happen to you. So both Sean and Kim noted that Bryce was also abusing alcohol like, pretty severely on top of um, Vivian. So on August 27th, Bryce seemingly randomly broke up with Kim. Like things seemed fine. He like kind of started acting funny and then broke up with her. And I have a picture of Kim and Bryce on the screen now. So his breakup was via text message and it read that Kim would be better off without him. This same day, he sent Sean a text message saying, I love you, bro. Seriously, you are the best person I've ever met. You saved my soul. He also gave Sean his Xbox that same day, as well as gave away a pair of diamond earrings that was gifted to him by his mom. So I heard this and like right away, I was like, okay, he's planning to commit suicide. Um, but there's so many more details that we have to go through, but I think you are probably thinking the same thing as me, is uh, he's having a mental break, something is going on, and it definitely could be five ants related, drug related. So the following day, August 28th, Sean called Bryce's mother out of concern for Bryce because of everything that happened the day prior and breaking up with Kim, the text he received, giving away these things. And, um, I guess it was more of a just, hey, just so you know, conversation. I don't think they put anything into action quite yet. So, around 11 p.m. on August 28th, this is the same day that Bryce's mother was called. Bryce was at his now ex-girlfriend Kim 
mom's house. I don't, I mean, maybe they were just talking things through. I don't know. But Kim was so concerned with Bryce's behavior, just acting funny, talking funny, that she did not think he could drive. So Kim took Bryce's keys away and Bryce was so upset by this. He was ready to go and leave that he called his own mom who convinced Kim to give Bryce his keys back, which she did. And Bryce left Kim's home around 1130 after telling his mom to not come and check on him. Like he's going to come see them soon. And he had a lot to talk to her about. So she assumed that he was going home to his apartment and going to bed. But at one in the morning on August 29th, this is again the same evening, just like a couple hours later, but it has passed over to the next day. Bryce again called his mom from a location near Sacramento, which is where he lives, um, but not, not in Sacramento. It's like to the east of Sacramento. And she, I don't think he, she answered, but she assumed her son had gone to bed. He did not go to bed. He was driving around, apparently. And at 11 in the morning, Bryce's parents were notified that Bryce had taken advantage of their roadside assistance service that evening. So they followed up with this. They wanted to know, okay, who went out and assisted him? What happened? And they got a hold of a man. His name is Christian. And this man delivered him three gallons of fuel around nine in the morning on August 29th. So the man that helped Bryce offered to return to the spot where he brought him the fuel, in which he did. And he found Bryce in the same exact spot hours had passed. He was just sitting in his car. So this was around three in the afternoon. Like he was just sitting in his car. So that this man, Christian, walked up to Bryce and he said, hey, your parents are really concerned about you. I think you need to drive home. And he watched Bryce agree and drive away. More hours went by to the point where Bryce definitely would have been home if he had driven straight home so his parents ended up filing a missing persons report because they couldn't get a hold of him they did not know where he was he was clearly going through something so police actually found bryce very quickly he was just a few miles from where christian had just spoken to him where he initially had fuel brought to him and police were like hey uh your parents are looking for you they're really concerned and police said that bryce was very friendly they even said like he was lucid it didn't seem like he was under the influence of anything and they even looked in his car and no drugs or alcohol was found so police got bryce to call his parents even though he did not want to but they they again just begged him please come home we need we can figure this out whatever you're going through just get home now so police watch him hop onto i-5 in the direction of his parents home bryce's parents again did not see bryce in the couple hours that it should have taken him to get there and they're you know, freaking out as they have been literally all day. And at 2 a.m., Bryce, they get a phone call from Bryce. And this is when Bryce said he was so exhausted from driving and that he needed to pull off and get some sleep. And I guess she agreed and figured she would see him in the morning. But I, like, I don't know because he should have been there so much sooner than 2 a.m. I feel like I don't, I don't know how I would react in this situation, but yeah, if your kid is like, I'm so tired, I'm going to fall asleep at the wheel, but you're like, how the heck aren't you home yet? What have you been doing? I feel like that's such a strange situation to be in. Um, but regardless, his parents go to bed and at 8 a.m. they wake up to a knock at the door, which was actually a patrol officer informing Bryce's parents that their son's car was fine was found abandoned at Castaic Lake. And Castaic Lake was still two hours from Bryce's parents' house. So the manner his car was found in was
was actually very odd. The, the rear window was shattered, but items like his laptop and phone were present in the vehicle, so it's like, okay, it probably wasn't someone trying to, like, break in and steal stuff, but why would it be shattered? Eh. So, because of the location of his car and the apparent missing Bryce, divers and search teams just flooded the area. They brought um, all-terrain vehicles, they brought scent dogs, and they actually followed a scent to a nearby truck stop, and then, like, the scent just went cold. I guess they didn't, like, make any hit further than the truck stop. And so, again, absolutely nothing has been found in regards to Bryce literally since this, all of this, since his car was found just like Brandon. This again brings us to theories and there's, there's quite a few. Um, Bryce was clearly struggling mentally. His actions that day were so incredibly strange. Why was he not driving home? He had left at he left at 11 30 from kim's house and was driving from kim's house basically driving around until i don't know at least 2 a.m when he called his mom the following day so that's like 24 hours of driving so was he in a manic state did he intend to drive home but like I, I don't know, was met with foul play. It still doesn't explain why he was driving for 24 hours. Did he ever intend to drive home? Was he playing with the idea of suicide, but he was, you know, stop and go about it? Was he wanting to do it? Was he not wanting? I, I think that answer, will never have that answer. Um, but the, one of the most sensible theories is that Bryce was struggling mentally and he was again struggling with the idea to take his own life and that that's why he was so stop and go he was like do I want to go see my parents do I just you know do I do this obviously this is a this is a big trigger warning I'll probably put that on the screen I'll definitely put that on the screen before um but his body was never discovered, so this theory, I guess, still could be plausible if it, if he went into the woods, if it was, it well, body was washed away with water, I think it's still a plausible theory, but generally, like, you generally find the body after something like this, so the next theory that is also very highly likely is, and almost more likely, is that the five ants he was taking just broke him and put him into this psychotic state. I think it explains why he was acting the way he was because it's unexplainable. But when you put a layer of something like five ants into it, you don't act in ways that are explainable. You don't act like a normal human would act, especially if he was suffering from one of those side effects of taking five ants when it's not prescribed to you. So I I want to kind of just mention the um, Eliza, Eliza Lamb um, case when she was found in a water tank. She was also under the influence and they didn't find her because they thought, oh, maybe she walked into a water tank. No, I think this is so highly likely because if you are under the influence like that, humans that are investigating aren't. They're thinking what the most likely thing is that you're doing, but under the influence, you could be literally doing anything. You could climb into a tree and you could be at the top of the tree and pass away from the elements. I, who knows? You could do the strangest things that aren't even fathom fathomable as an investigator. It's just... It, it's so, you can't know his potential actions if he's literally out of his mind or going in this psychotic state. Another theory is that Christian, the man who helped him with fuel, did something to him. Uh, I mean, the police met with him after his second encounter with Christian, so I, I guess, I don't know, it's maybe, it's maybe not super likely, um, but also he's, Bryce stayed in the area 
Yeah, so I guess if you wanted to go track him down again, it would not be hard. Another popular theory is that Bryce planned and succeeded with staging his disappearance or death and or starting a new life. So I, I don't like this theory mainly because I feel like people don't do that often and I could be totally ignorant to the fact that maybe a lot of people do this, but I don't know from what I've seen, I guess. Yeah, I feel like that statement is kind of off base. There's so many missing people. Maybe a ton of them are people staging a disappearance. I guess we, we just don't know that, but I, I don't know how that fits in with his actions. I feel like there's a lot easier ways to accomplish starting a new life than, you know, like going through all the weird things that he went through as far as like phoning his mom and, and stop and go and having the police get involved and calling roadside assistance. And I, I just feel like it can't be that if you're staging your disappearance, like you're staging someone abducting you or like a suicide or I, why are you calling roadside assistance as part of your plan to disappear? And you know, we can't, we probably can't write it off entirely, but because there are a lot of people who really are behind this theory, I just don't know how I feel about it. I feel like we kind of glossed over his rear window being shattered. I also, I mean, I don't really know in any of these theories how that fits, um, unless it, you know, fits in with the, in the first theory I mentioned, the suicide theory, like, I don't know, can someone punch, like, out of anger, like, punch your wind, like, I feel like you can punch it, or even if you are just having a psychotic break. And I guess another theory is that he didn't do anything to himself, but did have a psychotic break and had an accident, just an accident somewhere falling, just kind of like with Brandon's theories. Maybe he fell, maybe a wild animal found him. There's literally so many things that could have happened. It's crazy and it it bothers me. Both of these do. Always mysterious disappearances and mysterious deaths just drive me nuts. I feel so bad for their families. Oh my gosh. I feel so bad. It's like one thing, having a loved one taken from you, but a, you know, a lot of families get closure. A lot of families don't. So both of these men, both still missing with little to no leads. Both families deserve the truth and they deserve to be given at least a shred of information to lead them somewhere to give them some hope of closure about their loved one and it may be that they never get that so i just ask that you guys please keep them in mind keep these families in your mind and thoughts today and with that just please yourself stay safe and happy and i will see you guys not next week i did change my upload schedule i'm just having a a hard time keeping up with things so we're doing every other week for the time being i i do want to get back to every week at some point but i will keep you posted on that so bye and thank you guys for watching